Hey, welcome back to the Gray Zone. It's Max Blumenthal here with award-winning Canadian journalist Aaron Mate. And uh, it's another stream on a particularly crazy day. Um, trying to get us up on Rockfin right now, which is always a challenge. We're on Twitter, obviously YouTube, which limits a lot of what we can do and what we can show. Uh, especially relating to the massacre of aid workers, one of the most significant events of this war, of this assault on Gaza, on the same day that Israel struck an Iranian consulate in Damascus, killing a top IRGC general, several Iranian officials, killing several Syrian workers, violating the diplomatic sovereignty of Iran, violating the Vienna Convention, I believe it's section 31 or section, it's a, it's one of those 30s sections on the inviability of consular facilities. And on that same day, a heinous massacre carried out by Israel at Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City was uncovered as Israeli troops withdrew from that the Al-Rimal neighborhood of Gaza City. So welcome everybody to the stream. Obviously a lot of lot to talk about. Welcome, Aaron. Um, yeah, feel free to get us started with any any uh, topic you want to cover. Well, it's hard. As you just laid out, there are all these atrocities Israel is carrying out are, are mind boggling. Like, do you start with uh, Israel <clears throat> destroying Gaza's largest medical facility, Al Shifa, leaving hundreds of dead bodies after it withdrew? Um, the attack on Iran, um, the consulate there, the the diplomatic facility in Damascus that uh, is an act of war, as you said, attacking Iran's sovereign territory because that's what a um, embassy is. Um, and then you have, of course, Israel killing these aid workers from World Central Kitchen. And since that is the dominant news right now, we should start there. But all these stories are just equally important and so so shocking and how brazen israel is how entitled israel is and being able to carry out acts like this like so many times during this genocide israel's done something where you couldn't have imagined that even a entity as evil as israel could have done it but they do they constantly just um defy the imagination so let's start there uh it's because that's what's dominating the news right now the biden administration is being forced to respond um this after all is israel not just killing aid workers but killing a partner of the biden administration and their policy in gaza uh yeah. because world central kitchen as you and wyatt reed wrote about recently at the gray zone world central kitchen has been actually helping the biden administration in their in their goal of undermining unra and replacing unra the u.n agency for palestinian refugees we're definitely going to get into that um i think that is the aspect that Few other media organizations will touch. Probably only the organ, the only those outlets that covered the Hannibal Directive back in October will tell you about the real role of Han Jose Andres in World Central Kitchen in Gaza. And it was an insidious one that we covered last week. This was the scene of a car carrying. Five, I believe five World Central Kitchen aid workers and a Palestinian driver. And you can clearly see they were hit with a drone strike. The missile went right through the World Central Kitchen logo on top of the car. And the scenario in which they were killed is shocking. Uh, according to Israeli media, let's... Uh, read a machine translation of a Haaretz article, or at least summarize it, explaining how these aid workers were killed in a deconflicted zone in the central Gaza city of Deir al-Bala, where they were seeking to set up field kitchens. And keep in mind, as Wyatt Reed and I reported, something that was buried in, or left out of other media reports about WCK coming to Gaza, they were coordinating directly with the Israeli military and Kogat 
which is the Israeli military bureaucratic branch in charge of maintaining the siege of Gaza. So this is machine translation of Haaretz, basically saying <clears throat> the attack in which seven aid workers, seven aid workers were killed um, in the vehicle convoy during which a drone fired three missiles, one after the other. The description of the events preceding the attack indicates that a convoy and three cars from the World Central Kitchen left last night to accompany an aid truck to the organization's food warehouse in the Darabala area of central Gaza Strip. The vehicles were clearly marked as belonging to the organization on the roof or on the sides. However, according to the sources briefed on the details of the incident, the uh, unit responsible for securing the Axis, the Israeli army unit, responsible for securing the access where the convoy was traveling, identified an armed man on the truck and suspected that he was a terrorist, a member of Hamas. Anyone in Hamas can be killed. Until the preliminary operations for the attack, blah, 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 the truck arrived at the warehouse along with other three vehicles, including seven volunteers, two Palestinians, um, who are dual U.S. and Canadian citizens, and then the rest were Australian, British, Polish. A few minutes later, the three cars of World Central Kitchen left the warehouse without the truck on which the gunman was allegedly identified. So without that, and I'll go into that in a second, the person did not leave the premises of the warehouse. So this is a security source inside the Israeli military saying that as these three cars left the warehouse, there was no armed man with them. While the convoy was traveling on the approved route, approved by the military, the location of the unit responsible for securing the route ordered the drone operators to attack one of the vehicles with a missile. I mean, this is already absolutely crazy. Some of the passengers were seen getting out of the car after the missile hit, so they survived the first drone strike and moved to another car. They continued the journey trying to escape from an Israeli drone on the approved Israeli route and even informed those responsible for them, the HML, the, mil the, the military unit responsible for their protection, that they'd been attacked. Seconds later, a second missile hit their vehicle. Then the third car in the convoy approached them and the passengers had survived the second attack. They transferred into the third vehicle, wounded people, and tried to get them out of danger. But then a third missile was fired at the third car and all seven of the volunteers were killed in that final attack. So this is just shocking. Uh, and this is, you know, of course, what's been happening to Palestinians, to Palestinian aid workers, to regular Palestinian people, people fleeing all throughout this genocide. But this is, uh, this, this, this is unique in that their route was approved by the Israeli military. They were under the personal protection of an Israeli military unit. They're coordinating with the Israeli military. And as Aaron said, they're there on a special mission to supplant UNRWA, the United Nations, which Israel is seeking to kick out. Um, so it really doesn't get any more psychotic than this. And the details of the killings are just, I mean, absolutely disgusting. I really would love for the drone footage to come out. It would look a lot, I think, like the collateral murder video we saw of the U.S. military in Iraq released by Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. So just to underscore this, they hit not one, not two, but three different vehicles from World Central Kitchen. Uh, they killed seven people, including an American. Um, we'll play in a second the Biden administration's response, which, of course, is, you know, uh, they're basically already saying that Israel didn't do this deliberately. Uh that this was just a tragic mistake. They're repeating Netanyahu's talking point. Um, and what has been the result? Well, a World Center Kitchen said they're going to shut down their operations. They're going to suspend their uh, aid deliveries in Gaza, which is understandable, which means I think that Israel has achieved its goal because why else would they kill these aid workers, attack three of their vehicles? They don't want any food going to Gaza, even though World Central Kitchen is serving another Israeli U.S. goal of undermining UNRWA. Uh, even a higher priority for Israel is to starve the people of Gaza. And so therefore, you can't tolerate anybody delivering food, even meager amounts, to the people of Gaza. And therefore, these aid workers had to be made an example of. They were martyred by Israel to send the message that, that you know Israel is not going to let the people of Gaza live. And so therefore, these people had to die. 
I, I, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's unclear to me, was there some kind of rift within the Israeli military? I'd seen actually Jose Andres, the founder of World Central Kitchen, complain that while he was fi finding uh, cooperation within Kogat, the bureaucratic siege masters of Gaza, the Israeli military itself was not very compliant. And what you have are like practically teenagers, kids in their late teens, early 20s, in an air-conditioned office somewhere, maybe in southern Israel at some base, drone jockeys, just hitting, hitting anything that moves. The command structure in the Israeli military is clearly broken down. I mean, you have one of the top commanders of the Israeli military, Barak Hiram, getting promoted or considered for a promotion as military secretary to Netanyahu after he was reprimanded for blowing up Israel University. Remember that giant deton detonation of a private university with no connection to Hamas in Gaza? He did that, and he's been confirmed as the author of the killing of 12 Jewish Israeli citizens in Kibbutz Beri on October 7th. So, I mean, this is just a degenerate terror militia running rampant with the most high-tech weapons ever seen in human history. And now they've killed, they look, they killed white people. We know the Biden administration doesn't care when they kill the natives, 32,000, yeah. but now they've killed a Polish citizen, an Australian, uh, people who dedicated their lives to you know, delivering aid. And they were, I mean, this is a great point by Ali Abunima um, that I think we need to put front and center here before we show anything else. Just something that we're reiterating, which is that here you have Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari from the, you know, Israeli, he's the Israeli top propagandist. And he spoke with Jose Andres to apologize to him and expressed the deepest condolences, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, the work of World Central Kitchen is critical. Okay, and Ali asks, Ali, founder of Electronic Intifada, why does the Zionist genocide regime call the work of World Central Kitchen, quote, critical after announcing it will destroy UNRWA, the only agency truly capable of providing for the needs of everyone in Gaza at required scale? Think, think. It's because they were supposed to supplant UNRWA. Jose Andres is a State Department culinary ambassador. He's pals with Joe, with Tony Blinken. He was sitting right in front of me and Anya Parampil, when we went to Samantha Power's big rollout of the DIA app for Ukraine, he's a, a State Department asset. And so that's why they were letting them in. And then they still killed them. They're biting the hand that feeds Israel is biting yeah. the hand that feeds it. As you guys reported at the Gray Zone, uh, you and Wyatt Reed, uh, Jose Andres's group was building uh, like a little port to deliver uh, yeah. aid to Gaza out of the rubble of homes from Gaza. Yep. Um, that's and, the extent of his collaboration. And and recall, and Ali Abanima, I believe, pointed this out too, that after October 7th, Jose Andres put out a statement basically blaming Hamas for everything and saying Israel's a right to defend itself. So basically signaling yep. his support for Israel's mass murder campaign. Yeah, this is the, uh, some footage of the port we they're building. Whoops, and that just got us demonetized because it has some copyrighted music in the background. Uh, anyway, yeah, this is the, I mean, you look at this and yeah, they're, they got the UAE United Arab Emirates to sponsor this. Um, basically probably the U S state department went to the UAE and said, you sponsor this, um, something to do. They're bringing 240 tons of food on this ship with this organized NGO called open arms. And they're building a jetty in Northern Gaza with the rubble of Palestinian homes against the wishes I would assume of most people in who own those homes. I mean, they're still the owners of those homes, but they're all evacuated, ethnically cleansed, stuck in the South. <laughs> who knows if there are human remains in those homes. And this is the beginning of the Gaza death port that the Biden administration has proposed to build two months from now, which we've covered extensively. And Aaron, I mean, that port, is it really to bring aid in or is it to bring a certain something out? You know what I'm saying? Uh, no, I don't actually. <laughs> okay. What, what uh, all right. Let me try to break it down. How are Israel 
wants to thin the population of Gaza. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. How are they going to get them to Europe? They can get them through Egypt or it'll be a lot easier on a floating dock. And there's been discussions about that uh, with Ron Dermer, special representative to Netanyahu on arranging ships for evacuees to Europe, which will uh, face another migration crisis for the U S Israeli war that it sponsored after doing the same with Syria. So this is the beginning of the Gaza death port and world central kitchen was uh, sort of involved in a insidious way. Now that's not to say that, I mean, these workers were not selfless or that they were not true humanitarians. It's not them shaping the agenda. They just wanted to go and help. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And I think your point about the possibility of there being a split inside Israel, I think that's uh, really important to think about because obviously there are some people who might think that using World Central Kitchen is good because it serves the goal of undermining UNRWA, which was their main use. But then, as we know, as we've seen openly, Israel is a psychotic state full of people who openly brag about cutting off food to the entire population. So therefore, that imperative of forcing Gaza, Gazans to starve I think is what took precedence here, that whoever was behind this in the, in the Israeli military, that that was their driving goal, that whatever political goals they had in destroying UNRWA, that was second to the goal of making Gaza starve, uh, forcing Gazans yeah. to suffer, um, because that's yeah. what Israel does. It, its entire existence is collective punishment on the people of Palestine for anyone uh, punishing any act of resistance. And Gaza especially has been the source of the, the center of Palestinian resistance um, since it was established, since it was established basically uh, as a refugee camp for so many refugees expelled from neighboring uh, parts of Israel. And therefore Gaza has to pay a price. It's it's always had a, a special uh, sort of significance for Israel is like they would never, they were, they were able to pacify large parts of the West Bank uh, through uh, the so-called peace process, but they weren't able to do the same thing to Gaza. And therefore, the people of Gaza have to suffer. And now aid workers have to suffer too. And and as you pointed out, these are not the first aid workers to be killed by Israel. There have been hundreds of them killed so far. But these are aid workers who are white, they're international, and they're working for a State Department collaborator. That's how yeah. brazen Israel is. Yeah, I was kind of tempted to go down to the State Department today and just shout out, do white lives matter? You know? <laughs> Because <laughs> obviously you don't care about the lives of brown people who are from there, but <laughs> I mean these these uh, apparently an American citizen was killed. Um, let's look at the response of uh, U.S. Israeli reciprocal spokesman John Kirby, who speaks for the Biden administration to this massacre. Uh, here's the question. Any conditions? Yes, they have a right. We're not sending it. So how can the U.S. continue to send aid to Israel without? any conditions yes they have a right we're not country. sending aid to israel we're sending aid into gaza uh and that's <laughs> how can they how can the u.s can continue to send military aid military to assistance israel without any conditions is there no red line that no, no, you? you know we've had this we've had this discussion you and me quite a bit from up here um they're still <laughs> under a viable threat of hamas um we're still going to make sure that they can defend themselves and the 7th of october doesn't happen again that doesn't mean that it's a free pass that that we that we look the other way when something like this happens or that we aren't and haven't since the beginning of the conflict urged the Israelis to be more precise, to be more careful uh, and quite frankly, to uh, increase the, num the the amount of humanitarian assistance that gets in. Um, uh, you know, we, I haven't been asked about it yet, but I expect that I would be. You know, there was a discussion just yesterday with our Israeli counterparts about Rafa. Now, this one was done virtually. We expect it'll be an in-person meeting here in, uh, in a week's time or so. Uh, but the whole reason to have that meeting was to talk about our concerns over a major ground operation in Rafa and to present viable alternatives for them to be more precise and more targeted. So the idea that we're, uh, we're, we're some plastic graveyard here and we're not paying attention to, uh, to the civilian casualties or the civilian suffering is just not true. Right, but these are verbal urgings, verbal commitments. There's no other incentive besides. I, I, I know you want us to, you want us to hang some sort of condition over their neck. And what I'm telling you is <laughs> that we continue to, 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 to work with the Israelis to make sure that they are as precise as, as they can be and that more aids getting in and, and we're going to continue to, to take that approach. Well, they were pretty precise, weren't they? I mean, they actually hit the logo. Exactly. They hit all three cars. 
So exactly. we're not going to hang any condition over Israel's neck. Yeah, and we that's don't have not, any leverage. Yeah, that's an honest expression of policy. They're not going to do a single thing. They're going to keep having meetings on Zoom. That's what they're going to keep doing, and maybe in person, either in person or in Zoom, they're going to the same meetings where they plot on how to um, destroy the people of Gaza, uh, make their yeah. homes, make their home uninhabitable, so that they have nothing to. Uh, live in once this thing uh, finally ends. Wh whenever, whenever the U.S. finally says that they've had enough. But um, and uh, look, they've been having these meetings from the start before Israel launched its all-out assault on Gaza. They were having meetings. I mean, what did that accomplish from the point of, G of of John Kirby here? I mean, all it looks like is the U.S. is an accomplice to Israel because, meanwhile, what's been happening, and we've just gotten more word of this. Last week, there was a report in the Washington Post that Biden sent off. Uh, quietly more bombs to Israel, including those 2,000 bombs that initially Biden administration officials were saying they were no longer going to send. Remember that? This was early yeah. November where when when um, Israel was under, you know, just global criticism for uh, dropping these massive U.S. supplied bombs on densely populated areas of Gaza. So they came out with this talking point, which they fed, of course, to the New York Times, that they were going to give Israel smaller this bombs. This smaller is, bombs. This is from this is from early November. Um, the the measures include using smaller bombs against Hamas. U.S. officials said. I mean, first of all, that's a joke on its face, <laughs> even if it's true, because the bombs are not being dropped on Hamas. They're being dropped on densely populated areas. But also, they didn't even send these smaller bombs. They're still sending the exact same two thousand pound bombs they were sending from the start. Uh, and that was newly confirmed last week by the Washington Post. Well, they hit the aid convoy with smaller bombs. Those were hellfires. <laughs> there you uh, go. Yeah. Those hellfires might be um, familiar to a lot of Israeli attendees of the Nova Electronic Music Festival who are trying to get away. That's what they use to kill people who are getting away. I guess they use those. Those are the bombs they use on white people. I don't know what it is, but you know, the, 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 the smaller bombs are, are, are killing people and they're sending tons of 2000 pound bombs. Let's listen to state department spokesman, Matthew and, and, and Matthew Miller, of uh, uh, team Gargamel. We have some buffering to do here. Let me uh, reset this. It's a long exchange, and I wanted to get to the relevant part. Um, so I got it now. Matthew Miller's been up there day after day after day, just defending everything, everything that Israel does. I don't know how you can psychologically withstand that unless you are a, just a venal sociopath. Uh, but here he is. At the same time, we are committed to Israel's right to self-defense. And this Sorry, is we a didn't add the uh, trap the music. United States has made that it made before October seventh, and that continues. Uh, uh, it, <clears throat> it continues since October seventh. So, it obviously the fight in Gaza is connected to Israel's long-term security in very substantial ways. I got into some of that with with response to Matt's question. Uh, but Israel still faces, for, <clears throat> uh, on in addition to the security challenge posed with, in Gaza, it still faces an Iran that is hostile to Israel. It still faces Hezbollah on its northern border that is hostile. This to is why they need 2,000 pound bombs. This is the question. Israel. And so we are going to continue to support Israel's ability to defend itself against those sworn enemies that want to see it, it end as a modern state or a state at all. Just the thought of a 2,000-pound bomb is self-defense. A 2,000-pound bomb is self-defense. Um, uh, so they need to have the ability to defend themselves against a very well-armed adversary. Like I said, Iran, Hezbollah, which has thousands and thousands of fighters and quite sophisticated uh, material and quite sophisticated weaponry, as we've seen them deploy <coughs> excuse me, against Israel in the last few days. So yes, they do need the, the, the modern military equipment to defend yeah, themselves against the adversaries. And we have made clear to them that he, when, the reporter that points whatever, out we, he, they used him in Gaza. Uh, whatever weapon they use in Gaza, be it a bomb, be it a tank round, be it anything, that we expect them to use those weapons in full compliance with international humanitarian law. And we Unbelievable. Um, so they're still defending, sending bombs that 
seriously, I cannot think of any military right now that has or is using 2000 pound bombs in urban warfare settings. I can't think of it. I mean, I guess you could point to the U S and Mosul and Raqqa to some extent, but it's, I, we've never seen in military history, uh, modern military history, post-World War II history, the use of 2000 pound bombs. So this is another kind of like legal red line that Israel is violating to create new space for countries like the U.S. to do the same. This is one of Israel's key exports is criminality, the normalization of criminality. And here you have the State Department defending that. And uh, I mean, there's one more disgusting clip I want to play. Uh, John Kirby, U.S.-Israeli reciprocal spokesman John Kirby. This was today. Um, also on sending 2000 pound bombs. We never, we've, I don't think we ever, even under the Bush administration, I don't think we saw this amount of def just advocacy for war crimes, like at this scale with this level of shamelessness. Uh, but this is definitely Rumsfeldian. Right. Well, on the point of conditions, the present on February 8th, issued a memo and it said, uh, and you already know this, but just for context, it said that it was the policy of this administration to prevent arms transfers that risk facilitating or otherwise contributing to violations of human rights or international humanitarian law. Is firing a missile at people delivering food and killing them not a violation of international humanitarian law? Well, the Israelis have already admitted that uh, this was a mistake that they made. They're doing an investigation. They'll get to the bottom of this. Let's not get ahead of that. Um, your, your question presumes at this very early hour that it was a deliberate strike, that they knew exactly what they were hitting, that they were hitting aid workers and did it on purpose. And there's no evidence of that. I would also remind you, sir, this is amazing. that we continue to look at incidents as they occur. The State Department has a process in place. And to date, as you and I are speaking, they have not found any incidents where the Israelis have violated international humanitarian law. And lest you think we don't take it seriously, I can assure you that we do. We look at this in Yeah, I don't think you do. I have never violated international humanitarian law ever in the past five to six months. I'm telling you, the State Department has looked at incidents in the past and has yet to determine that any of those incidents violate international humanitarian law. Right. Oh my God. <sighs> Never has Israel violated international law in the last five months, according to John Kirby, with just total confidence. Uh, he's even, he's, he's, condes he's speaking condescendingly to the reporter. I assure you, sir, sir. He's like one of those guys in, 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 in line when you, you know, at the airport, like, sir, sir, sir. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. He with total. Do you actually think that we don't take international law seriously? Our lawyers affirm this. They are not soft-handed, pencil-neck little Eichmanns providing support for legal support for an illegal genocide. I mean, it's amazing. Like who the whole, and you can see the press is just completely turned on them. At a certain point, I think the press corps. I mean, if they had, if they cared about mass murder, they would boycott these sessions. Like, why should they dignify John Kirby with their presence? Why yeah, what if they all stood up and turned their backs? Yeah, like, why does he deserve to the right to be able to sit there and just lie through his teeth and support this genocidal regime um, with such condescension, too? Uh, they should, boy I mean, they won't because, of course, the, if you're there in that room, then you're there for access and you identify with people like John Kirby. I mean, not everybody, obviously, but but many people, but... If they had dignity, I think that they would do that. It's such a sick display, and he seems to enjoy it along with Matt Miller. Um, it's worth psychologically analyzing one day. Like, what prompts a person to take such pleasure in being so evil and such a oh, malicious liar? I can I can tell you. Um, you have um, the two spokesmen at the State Department, Vedant Patel, and you got John Kirby, and. Kirby's further ahead than them, but he used to be the State Department spokesman under Obama with Jen Psaki. And Jen Psaki's living the dream. She is the top propagandist on the outside for the White House at MSNBC. She's kind of like a celebrity. And she was just like, 
she was like a loser when we would just laugh at her when she was at the state department because she would fumble constantly john kirby would lose his temper all the time i remember guyan chicken the rt reporter he completely lost it on her and told her to go back to russia or something and matt lee had to get john kirby back in line so these are very like um, mediocre people vidant patel i remember at one briefing he's the um he's a former spokesman for pramila jayapal comms director for Pramila Jayapal. So he comes out of the office of a like progressive member of Congress. Yeah. He's Indian American. And he made a joke at one briefing that his parents were disappointed that he didn't become a doctor. So basically he's taking a rebellious route as the son of immigrants. And he hopes that he can become like a top diplomat, maybe a counselor to a top US ambassador in a conflict zone and show his parents that he was actually on the right path in life. And if it means defending genocide, whenever Matt Miller's not in the room, then he'll just have to do that for his family. Then you got Matthew Miller, who looks kind of just like Gargamel in his youth, he feel it just feels like that, like he's completely soulless. He's the former comms director for Robert Menendez, who historically has been one of the top five recipients of APAC aid and has been jailed or has gone his way to jail maybe after taking gold bars, literal gold bars, like, <clears throat> like, like a cartoon pimp from an Egyptian lobbyist. He already was on corruption trial once. Uh, his his uh, defense was paid for by APAC donors. So that Matthew Miller then ran a crisis communications firm when Trump was in office. And I think he's just going to, he's going to cycle back through the revolving door and make tons of money telling his high level clients that he handled crisis communications for the biggest crisis an administration has faced in years. And he's just going to make tons of money and move to a mansion in Potomac, Maryland. That's what he wants. And now Kirby has his own team. He's been moved up from the Pentagon to like the main man defending the White House. He's kind of more important than uh, what's her name, Jean Karine Pierre. Karine Jean Pierre, who Karine who, has a, who has a background at who's Haitian American and has a background yeah. actually working in Haitian, you know, Haitian solidarity. I think I think she even worked once briefly with Kim Ives of Haiti yeah. Liberté. She did, uh, and she did. But look at her now. I mean, now she's up there every day, uh, you know, you know, whitewashing the Israeli genocide and, it, you know, uh, making fun basically of activists, making light of activists who challenged Joe Biden about this and uh, like uh, dismissing the concerns of Arab Americans and Muslim Americans. Um, that's her life now. Yeah. And imagine her life working if she was working at Haiti, IT Liberté's office in East New York. I mean, I've been there. She's part of the Beltway elite. She is with uh, Julianne Malvo, who's a famous correspondent. She's also kind of come up from nothing, uh, replacing Jen Psaki um, and is not as talented as Jen Psaki, which isn't saying much. And now she, she's just famous. I mean, and th so these people are choosing celebrity and fame over opposition to genocide. I know people working at lower levels throughout the Biden administration um, who feel the same way. It's like, why would they give up if they're at the DOJ, the possibility of like um, leveraging those connections that you get in the DOJ into a multi-million dollar job at a law firm where you're going to help corporate clients get off light and you are going to live in a mansion too. And you have kids, you have a, maybe a young kid. Hey, you want the best for them. Who cares about all those kids getting slaughtered in Gaza? If you quit, what are you going to do? Uh, yeah. Work under Matt Dust somewhere? Like, what are you going to do? Uh, so it's stark. And these people are motivated by careerist ambitions completely. They are just like clawing their way to the top with not a lot of talent. I got to say, I think John Kirby's the most talented because he's the most like just confident liar no one believes well, what, him. what's amazing about Corinne jean pierre is she can't look up when she's talking yeah she she it's like she knows that everything she's saying is a lie and she feels some shame about it so she just does not look up which is amazing for a white house press secretary to do i mean if you're gonna have that job you have to be a committed liar and she's not she can't look people in the eye so it's awkward when she's up there it's awkward because you can see just in her body language how strained everything is the point where she can't make eye contact with the people she's lying to. 
Yeah, that's a really good observation. I would love to see some body language expert analyze her and the other um, mouthpieces of genocide. These other kind of like Gerbers, Gerbers, how do you say it? Gerbolzian figures. <laughs> it's yeah. a tough one. That is as a, a non-German speaker. Do you want to hear more from John Kirby about this, or uh, or should we move on? Because I, I I have one more clip. I have let's one get, more clip. Let, let's do let's it's Kirby time. You described uh, you described the uh, the strike as a uh, possible mistake by Israel, according to uh, Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper. It wasn't one strike, but three. The first one, then an interval during which aid workers got out of their vehicles, removed the wounded, tried to move to another vehicle. Which Is that was Andrew there. Feinberg? And then a third strike, what as they tried to move and escape in a third. That is Andrew Feinberg, but I forgot oh who God. he is. He was he was, he, he was like he was the Gate, right? he was the plant inside Sputnik who tried to become a Russiagate figure and like okay. never never rose to the level. He tried right, so to he, be like an FBI asset inside Sputnik <laughs> and like he didn't make the cut. Right, I remember that he tried to be. He tried. This is during the peak of Russiagate. Yeah, and he tried to cash in as like a Sputnik, uh, like denouncing his former colleagues. And yeah, and he was um, like, "This guy put his feet up on the table in the lunch break room, like, and he's Russian." Well, he's obviously been rewarded with some kind of job that puts him in the White House uh, briefing, which, <laughs> is where, which is where he belongs. And you know, so RussiaGate does always pay. Russiagate grifting does always pay. So um, I mean, it's an interesting. I mean, it's interesting to look at all these different characters. So he, Andrew Feinberg just does whatever he thinks the press is supposed to do because he's he's the loser kid who like kind of eats his boogers in the corner and wants everyone to kind of accept him. So he's actually turning on John Kirby because everybody is. <laughs> All right, let's hear his actual tape. <laughs> vehicle, at which point all of them uh, were dead. How would the second and third strikes of these marked vehicles be a mistake? And why would the US not more forcefully set conditions on the use of US made weaponry when it is being used to target aid workers? If the first one was a mistake, the second two were targeted with the intent of killing everyone in that convoy. So how do you respond to that? Uh, first of all, there's an investigation going on. So why don't we let it get done? And why don't we see what they find in terms of the decision-making process that led to this terrible outcome? The Prime Minister and the IDF have noted that it was their error. If you don't like the word mistake, their error. Uh, they're investigating it. Let them do that work and let them see what they come up with. Uh, and then we'll go from there. And, uh, so one, one, one more, John. Uh, two years ago, uh, the IDF killed uh, an Al Jazeera journalist. They said that that was a, a mistake uh, that she was wearing a Mark Press vest. She was shot anyway. They investigated it and they uh, released the findings of their investigation, which found that they were at fault. Go they on. Uh, but my, my question, sir, is in that case, uh, these the Israelis did not initiate any criminal uh, proceeding. In this case, if it's found that the marked convoy was deliberately targeted, if not with the first shot, but the second two shots, would the U.S. support <coughs> criminal penalties? As I said, we would expect that uh, should there be a need for accountability, that account accountability be properly put in place for whoever may be responsible for this. But again, that's going to a lot of that's going to depend on the investigation. Remember when uh, you know Biden said, uh, "If you harm an American, we're going to come for you," or something like that. Well, then look at this. Compare that to this blase response to Israel killing an American aid worker along with other internationals delivering food in Gaza. It's, you know, like we'll see what happens. We'll, you know, uh, and and who's doing the investigation? Yeah, Blinken has called for Israel to investigate itself again. Yeah, it's like uh, you know, like hello, uh, Mister Mister Dahmer, Mister Dahmer, Jeffrey. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yes, he opens the cracks, open the door. Um, yeah, it's uh, Milwaukee PD. Um, there have been a report of some uh, unusual smells in your apartment. Um, can you go inside and check it out for us and let us know if everything's okay? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. And then Jeffrey Dahmer comes back out like, yeah, everything's fine in here. Um, I don't see any um, uh, rotting corpses or anything. So you guys can go. All right. Sure, sure. Um, proceed. Uh, oh, by the way, do you guys want like a chocolate bunny I made down at the factory? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Dahmer. Like that's what we're dealing with, with the U.S. and Israel investigating itself, like the world's greatest 
criminal mafia <laughs> investigating itself. And well, that is for that is for the employees of someone who is like hosted Tony Blinken on his podcast, hung out with Tony Blinken, shilled for the Democrats, put himself out there as the greatest ally of USAID in Ukraine, Jose Andres, an official ambassador, culinary ambassador of the State Department. That's what he gets is the criminals get to investigate themselves. It's such an insult to Jose Andres, and it really shows a lack of dignity on his part to not just... Oh, turn the table over on Tony Blinken. Mm. Just like yank off the tablecloth, throw all your your little tapas creations and rub them in Tony Blinken's face, but you have no pride. This whole deference to an Israeli investigation, it brings up, or for me, it uh, evokes this famous headline from the New York Times. CIA says it has found no link between itself and crack trade. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Tim Wiener. Yeah. Hey, I got a... A, f a funny story about Tim Wiener. Uh, Tim Wiener is like the CIA fanboy who I think he wrote like one of the big books on CIA history. And uh, someone associated with the gray zone tried to interview him about a CIA related topic. And he said he wouldn't speak to them because of Aaron Mate and Max Blumenthal being oh, in the gray zone. What an honor. <laughs> what, an yeah. honor. what an honor. I was like, all right, we're doing we're doing the work. That's really funny. We're doing yeah. the damn thing. So uh yeah, so CIA. Someone, who's, someone whose job it is to cover the CIA is antagonistic to two journalists who happen to critically cover the CIA. Um and he have you know, so therefore, you know, like it's like what's the point of going into journalism if you're gonna protect the agency you're supposed to cover skeptically uh and be hostile towards journalists who actually Try to try to be critical. It's it's mind blowing, but th but that's everybody. Is you know that's that's what our media is right there. So it seems like this honor. little wiener wanted to protect his uh, access. Yeah. So that's uh, just a little side note. Um, great headline there. The CIA's investigation turned up nothing. <laughs> and um, we're, we've been talking a lot about international law, the violation of it. The post-World War II order is just being shredded before our eyes. It's just being obliterated by design. Um, the Israeli army has a legal advisor <clears throat> and the job of the legal advisor isn't to tell them, hey, you can't do this. It's against the Geneva Conventions. You can't bomb that embassy. It's against the Vienna Convention on the inviability of diplomatic facilities. They tell them how they can break international law in order to provide Israel with more leeway going forward to commit crimes, as well as other countries that are fun within the collective West that sponsors Israel. One of their former legal advisors was named, was named Daniel Reisner, and he said international law progresses through violations. So that's what we're witnessing in Gaza. That's what we witnessed um, two days ago with the Israeli deliberate targeted strike on Iran's embassy in Damascus, which killed many people. And this is about a larger agenda. After whenever the genocide ends and there's a ceasefire, at least when it officially ends, Israel's going to go and it's going to export not only the AI technology that it's been using, the facial recognition technology to kidnap and torture people who they claim are Hamas or the AI gospel system that it's been using for uh, generating targets faster than they can be hit. It's going to export its legal regime, which has normalized genocide to other countries, countries that might have restive populations of their own, insurgencies or uh, border crises or wars with other countries where they just want to blow up the international system along with lots of civilians. And they're going to say, well, Israel already did it so we can get away with it. That's the real meaning of Israel. Israel has nothing else to offer the world except for that. The world doesn't want its trashy culture. It doesn't need anything. It's, 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 it's food is all stolen from Arabs. It doesn't want anything from Israel except that. And it's field tested weapons and the world and the collective West especially is not has not stepped into the breach to stop this from taking place. 
All they're doing is delivering speeches at the UN. The only people trying to stop them are Houthis in sandals with RPGs, guys in track suits with RPGs in Gaza who've been grown up under siege and seen their entire families killed. Those are the only people standing between us and the normalization of an international order of genocide and ethnic cleansing and ethno supremacism. And so here we are at the UN today with a big debate over what Israel just did. And what, I mean, what did, what's your understanding of the significance, Aaron, of the strike on the Iranian diplomatic facility? Well, it looks like they're trying to drag uh, the U.S. into a war. Um, yeah. Why else would you attack the Iranian embassy in, in Damascus except to provoke a reaction from Iran and its allies um, and try, and, you know, which could trigger a war? And um, why they want to draw the U.S. in is because I don't think Israel wants to fight Hezbollah Iran's ally on its own because Hezbollah can do damage to Israel. It showed that last the last time Israel tried to fight Hezbollah in a major way in 2006. Uh, and so Israel knows that to defeat Hezbollah, which it wants to do because it hates anybody who dares resist its occupation and hegemony, uh, that they need the U.S. to do that. So therefore, if I think the thinking in Israel is if you can sufficiently provoke Iran and its allies, then that will force the U.S. to come in to back Israel up, as Biden has shown every indication so far that he would. Remember, after October 7th, what was his response? He sent in aircraft carriers into the region to back Israel up. And so yeah. I think Israel is trying to try to cash that chip um, yep. and, and get uh, a war going. Um, Expand the, the war. I can, yeah, yeah. That's only that's the only explanation that I have for, for 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 doing this, because you know it's routine for them to bomb Syria, and everybody lets them do that, including Russia, by the way, which I've never quite understood why Russia would let uh, its ally Syria be bombed regularly by Israel. Um, so that's been normalized. I mean, Israel's bombed airports, Damascus, Aleppo, multiple times. It bombed Aleppo just a few days ago, killed many people. But this going after a embassy is next level. Um, that's the rules-based international order in action. Yeah. We make the rules, you follow the orders. It's a replacement of the international order that was designed to prevent another genocide coming out of World War II that came out of the Nuremberg trials. Remember, the Nazi war criminals put on trial in Nuremberg, many of those who faced hanging, were not put on trial for genocide they were put on trial for war crimes, for just simple criminal atrocities carried out on the battlefield. Um, so the Nuremberg, Nuremberg sets the stage for anybody to be held accountable. It's not just about genocide or the Holocaust. Um, and, and you're right, this uh, attack is not about deterrence. It's not about deterring Iran, it's about drawing Iran in deeper. Iran has a clear strategy. It wasn't notified about October 7th or the Al-Aqsa flood operation. It came as a surprise. U.S. intelligence issued a declassified report determining that. Um, Hezbollah didn't know either. That's why the that's partly why the attack was so successful is they did not notify their allies. Uh, most people in Hamas didn't know. Hamas spokesman Bassem Naim recently told Al Jazeera he had no idea it was happening. Um, and they all, the political wing all gathered together and, and prayed because they were so surprised. Um, and so since then, Hezbollah and Iran have been engaged in a strategy that balances confrontation with Israel with caution to not take it too far, um, to not sacrifice all of Beirut to the full wrath of the Israeli military while continuing to push Israel back off the northern border and uh, try to maintain a one-to-one -one ratio of lost uh, soldiers on each side. Iran is, you know, hung back and they've even apparently caused some of the uh, militias, the, 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 the um, popular mobilization units in Iraq to actually stand down with their attacks on U.S. facilities. And Israel wants that dynamic to change in order to fulfill the dream of Netanyahu, his biggest dream, his, his meaning 
as prime minister is to drag the U.S. into a war with Iran. That's what it's all about. So, and it's not going to work. I don't think that's going to work. They're not going to stray from their path, the resistance axis. But here is the kind of disrespect that Israel is showing uh, to the U.S. with these kinds of uh, brazen violations of international law. The Pentagon's assessment that this was an Israeli strike. Have you all been in touch with the Israelis about this? We were not notified before the strike occurred. We have um, been engaged with them at different levels, but again, this was not a U.S. military strike, so I don't have a lot of the details on it. You have been engaging with them after the fact to discuss specifically their attack on this building in Damascus. We have engaged with them on various different levels, not to mention some of the um, uh, questions about the humanitarian aid workers that were also killed in the strike in Gaza. So the U.S. was not notified. Do you believe that? Uh, that's a great question. I I don't actually believe that. But um, that, but then again, with Israel, like you never know. Maybe they are so brazen and entitled that they would just go ahead and do this without informing the Biden administration. But certainly, whether they were informed or not, Biden's could have given. I mean, it's Biden's given them the green light to do whatever they want. Um, by never imposing any consequences and by continuing to su supply them with weapons, you know, going around Congress at least twice uh, to waive uh, congressional congressional uh, notification, these waivers that the Biden administration has invoked to just basically rush weapons to Israel, um, hiding these transfers from the public, uh, pretending, as John Kirby said before, that Israel is not violating any international law. So if you're Israel, I mean, I, I think it's fair to assume that if you do this, you're not going to suffer any consequences from Biden if you don't inform him beforehand. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> however, there is the, that's just the Pentagon. So there are other branches of the national security state that may have known. And we have this um, article, I think you've tweeted about it, in the Wall Street Journal about concern in Congress over U.S. and Israel's unprecedented intelligence sharing. As deaths mount in Gaza, some question whether American-provided information is adding to the humanitarian crisis. And this makes total sense. I mean, in the past, the, the NSA has provided Israel with access to its satellites to do targeting, for example, the second Lebanon war in 2006. Um, so the it's hard to imagine that they're not providing them with targeting assistance through, uh, you know, advanced satellite capability. Absolutely. Especially given this, this is from the Wall Street Journal in June, 2022 U S secretly reviews Israel's plans for strikes against Iranian targets in Syria. So, Damn. yeah. So, you know, there's a long record of this. Um, if you read this article in the journal by Michael R. Gordon, who was, involved, by the way, in the Iraq WMD scam when he was at the New York Times. He's very well connected with the national security state. It's clear from this article that every single Israeli strike in Syria, especially against a purported Iran target, uh, is a joint U.S.-Israeli-U.S. US strike, that the U.S. reviews every single strike and, and approves targeting, similar to what the U.S. does with Ukraine uh, when, it goes, when it's targeting Russia. So that's why I, I'd be surprised if... Uh, the U.S. wasn't involved in this one. But again, with Israel, you never know with these people because they're so entitled, they're so crazy that uh, sometimes they might do something that even they haven't been given permission to by, by the U.S. They're, they're pushing the line. They're pushing the boundaries further than we've ever seen them do. Yeah. And at the United Nations during this uh, extremely intense debate where every nation, including the U.K., was issuing everything from concern, deep concern to condemnation about Israel's violation of international law and striking this diplomatic facility. The U.S. stepped forward to issue a full-throated endorsement of what Israel did, speculating that uh, Iran was harboring terrorists inside its embassy. So the, U the U.S. Is, is just, whether they were notified or not, they're on board now, so get ready for more. Um, the question is, what do, what do Iran and its allies do to deter future attacks? Because the Syrian state and military are at a weak point. There's no disputing that. 
they can't respond directly. Um, I, you know, I've, I, I've seen video and statistics provided by the Syrian government of the so-called rebels backed by the CIA and the Gulf states and Turkey um, just systematically destroying surface to air missile batteries starting in 2013 all the way throughout the dirty war. And they reduced Syria's anti-aircraft capacity by like 50%. Now, mm -hmm. much of that has been restored, but it just gives you a sense of how there was a deliberate and systematic plan to weaken Syria's ability to deter these kinds of attacks. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, on that uh, point, after the recent uh, Israeli strike on Aleppo, where they killed uh, a lot of people, including civilians, I saw reports coming from Syria. I didn't look too closely into them, so maybe they're not confirmed. But from sources I, I reliably uh, trust, that immediately after Israel struck Aleppo, then you had uh, re so-called rebels in Idlib, which is the last so-called rebel-controlled province controlled by Al-Qaeda, um, they launched strikes on Aleppo as well, which yeah. to some people gave the appearance that basically these rebels were working, uh, if not uh, overtly with Israel, at least tacitly, that they were cooperating uh, in that way. So in that respect, it's it's ongoing. And, and by the way, it's worth pointing out here, as we've talked a lot about at the Gray Zone, Israel armed these rebels, uh, treated them in hospitals, paid their salaries. Israel was a huge part of the uh, coalition that waged the, the uh, decade-long dirty war in Syria. And you can see why. They were trying to weaken a state that is central to the resistance axis. And they've succeeded in large part. And they're continuing. Yep. Um, Idlib itself is a NATO carve-out in Syria, which the Syrian army needs to confront. So the only thing they can do is continue to host these elements on their soil, provide them with support after Israel supported ISIS and Al Qaeda in the Golan, the non-occupied part of Syria of the Syrian Golan, uh, providing them with weapons, logistics, uh, hospital services, and then evacuating the Al Qaeda affiliated white helmets. Um, so. Israel's just kind of coasting on the idea that it can continue to provoke escalation and it will not face a furious response. But I think once Iran is drawn in, if that happens, uh, it's it's not going to exactly be a cakewalk for Israel. Um, its society is much weaker than Iran's or Syria's, uh, whose people have nowhere else to go. And... Uh, and they're actually indigenous to that land and they have and they're fighting for something yeah you know, they're, they're they're fighting for their survival whereas israel is just fighting for its hegemony yeah and that creates a much different dynamic and yeah as you point out a lot a lot of israelis have other passports to other countries to western countries that they can go to that's not an option for most people most other people in that region yeah um uh, israel's already suffering enormously economically from the post-October 7th effect. It's uh, Ashkenazi elite, the intelligentsia, and much of the secure, securitocrat upper middle class. Most, Many of them have second passports and can just leave. Um, many of them sort of were trying to get out after October 7th. You have a, a political class in Israel that has degenerated to the point where Israel's foreign ministry yesterday issued a tweet trolling Jackson Hinkle, a long tweet trolling Jackson Hinkle and uh, proposing a satirical scenario in which Hinkle converted to Judaism and became Jackson Finkel. This is the political class and the dipl diplomatic class of Israel, how deeply it is degenerated. They cannot think rationally. They're not making rational decisions. Its military is not under any rational command structure. It's basically a hooligan rampage in Gaza, putting uh, snuff films on TikTok for the consumption of the entire world. And they have failed to achieve any of their major military objectives, and they will not achieve them in Rafa, they will just achieve another massacre. So they're stuck and they think that they can somehow escalate against Iran. Um, it's, it's, it's not going to be, it's, it's, it, it really actually shows their lack of uh, a plan and the desperation that they would seek to draw the U S in. And what we're witnessing in the U S 
is a serious political shift, which is moving the U.S. political establishment gradually away from this ironclad defense of Israel's interests to the point where you have only 18% of registered Democrats supporting Israel's Gaza genocide, Israel's war in Gaza. Only 18%. In a generation, it will be 0.8%, maybe 8%. I mean, the boomers live forever, but they're not even supporting it. Republican support for Israel's operation in Gaza has gone down 10 points in the last two months. Independent support is now at a bare minority and has dropped over 20 points. Uh, of course, we don't live in a real democracy, but there will come a point when the U.S. will not provide Israel with a protective umbrella. And at that point, you will see the enemies that Israel has engendered rain down furious rebukes, as it said in the book of Ezekiel. And it's not going to be pretty. They're setting the stage for that right now. I really think Al-Aqsa flood, October 7th, is just the preview of something bigger and more severe. Uh, so, you know, enjoy your time on the beach in Tel Aviv while it lasts. I just, under this current leadership, there, there isn't really any long-term planning. And uh, the aid, the slaughter of the aid convoy is just a, a one key piece in the picture that I just painted. You know, there are even some Israelis who think or are worried that they've even lost Donald Trump, one of the most ardent supporters. This was in the New York Times recently. Trump's call for Israel to finish up war alarms some on the right. Recent remarks he made urging an end to the Gaza conflict with no insistence on freeing the Israeli hostages first were another sign or were, were another departure from conservative support for Benjamin Netanyahu. I'm not sure if that fear is well-founded. Trump, I mean, is partly responsible for this whole disaster because he you know did Definitely. a lot to um undermine palestine rights moving the embassy to jerusalem um you know arming supporting israel as it massacred palestinians during the great march of return uh recognizing israel's theft of the golan heights pursuing these uh, normalization deals that sidelined the palestinians and entrenched israel's ties to gulf regimes but trump has been saying some stuff recently talking about the need for an end to this war which if you're being charitable could be interpreted as him calling on this war to end and not give unconditional support to Israel, although, uh, you know, not necessarily. But uh, the point is, Biden's position is not popular. Um, and it very well could cost him. No, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, we, we don't expect much of Trump, especially with Jared there. Uh, he's going to be somewhere in a powerful, influential position. You, you look at Trump in the interviews, he'll say, you know, they need to finish up or finish the job and you don't quite know what it means. Does it mean finish the genocide? And then he'll say, you know, and it's, yeah, yeah. it's not good that you bring down those buildings on top of like entire families. It just doesn't look good. Maybe you could like, you know, stop doing that. So it, it's, it's, he, he's, he, he knows Netanyahu's a psychopath. He doesn't like being bossed around by a guy who runs some crappy little apartheid colony 5,000 miles away, but he's kind of owned just like Biden. Uh, he's owned by the Adelson family and other big donors. At the same time, what's happening in the right-wing grassroots is highly significant. We've never seen this before, starting with Candace Owens, uh, kind of like finding her voice on Palestine. It is a religious and kind of chauvinistic voice where she's coming at it as a, you know, a Christian. That's her way of sort of justifying her sympathy for Palestinian. She's a mother of three. How could you not just be like sickened seeing these children killed all the time? It's also a disgust with uh, being controlled by this little neocon talentless rat boy who won't let her speak. Uh, and you just have had black performers and um, black celebrities feel like they're kind of like under the yoke of crazy Zionists. And Candace Owens is really speaking to that um, not endorsing ever, all the language she's used, but it's something we have to recognize. She's a highly significant figure in the right wing grassroots. Alex Jones is someone that I've criticized for a long time for kind of uh, pushing a pro-Israel line. I called him mainstream alternative media for that. He's flipped. 
He's calling what's happening in Gaza a robotic genocide. And he actually promoted Jeremy Lafredo's video of the block, the Israeli grassroots aid blockade, the pro-genocide protest in southern Israel to prevent aid from getting into Gaza. And Alex Jones expressed pure disgust with this. He's even hosted, <clears throat> um, you know, Middle Eastern journalists to talk about this genocide. Tucker Carlson is starting to find his voice on this and speaking out more. This is the number one media personality on Elon Musk's Twitter X. And I, I think he's going to become more vocal in the coming days. It is a situation where younger Christians, including Christian evangelicals, are realizing that there are Palestinian Christians, that there are actions like Christ at the checkpoint. They're watching the sermons by Munter Isaac yeah. from the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Bethlehem. Christ in the rubble, his Easter sermon was extremely powerful. And, you know, really like the only people left who increasingly in the Republican Party who are supporting this genocide are Christian Zionist dweebs, you know, geriatric Christian Zionist dweebs who wear diapers to go to John Hagee's sermons from the Schofield Bible where he, and it, it, and his whole operation was founded out of APAC or Charlie Kirk, this complete uh, tool of controlled opposition whose entire operation was funded by Zionists through the David Horowitz Freedom Center, who goes over to Israel and gives speeches with Im Tertsu, the youth wing of Netanyahu's party. Uh, completes, these are complete sellouts who are not representing the authentic right grassroots. And they try to like copy and, and just bite off the dissident right, but everybody in the in the, in the right knows they're like the 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 real dissident right. They know they're fake. So we've never seen this before. I'm telling you, a generational shift is coming in the U.S. A clash is building, and it's going to lead. It's going to lead to pressure that will ultimately remove Israel's strategic protective umbrella across the Middle East. And there's nothing Israel can do to stop it except shut down our democracy, shut down freedom of speech, shut down TikTok, fire university presidents, ban student clubs, and bomb and bomb and bomb and bomb. That's all they can do. Uh, I really hope you're right about that. And um, I was chuckling before only because I'm pretty sure that Alex Jones called it a genocide before AOC did. I think I think right after Alex Jones called it a genocide, uh, AOC came out and called it a genocide in a really good speech, actually, on the House floor that she gave to her to her credit. But it's still funny that in this era, Alex Jones <laughs> outflanked AOC uh, from the left when it comes to calling out a genocide. And credit to you know, there's a video of AOC being confronted by some uh, activists at a movie theater in New York where they were asking her why she hasn't. There it is, called out the genocide. And she was insisting that she had when she hadn't at that point. She only did, uh, you know, after that and after Alex Jones did it first. Yeah. So shout out to Alex Jones and these protesters. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Alex Jones sharing Jeremy's video. I mean, it's just like, yeah, we're, we're, we're Cyrus uniting the rival gangs against the vandals. That's what we're doing. I mean, we don't, you know, we're not afraid to unite people. Uh, but there's Riley. Uh, AOC's longtime partner, a rare ca on-camera appearance, and she's um, surrounded by anti-genocide, pro-humanity protesters coming out of a movie. You need to call it a genocide. No, I, I, I need you to understand that this is not okay. It's Wait, not okay that there's a genocide happening. You're not actively against it. You're lying. I'm lying. You're not. You put on TV and avoid talking about it. You're not acting against it. It's a genocide. We're not lying. We're not lying. We're not lying. We're not lying. It's insane. You haven't been calling it a genocide. Don't tell me I'm lying. Then just say it's a genocide. Just say it. Over 30,000 people are dead, are dead AOC. You can't just say it for once. Just say the word. That's it. That's all we want you to say. This is where it gets good. 
She's like, how dare you? Oh, and then Riley tries to step up. We're not doing anything. We're just talking to intellectual I mean, why not just stop and talk to them? That's it. Cut it, and you're going to cut this, and you're going to clip this so that it's completely out of context. I already said that it was. And y'all are just going to pretend that it wasn't over and over again. It's fucked up, man. And you're, you're not helping these people. TV. And you're not helping them. You refuse to. You're not helping them. You're not helping these people, she said. And then she finally calls it genocide. I mean, I think that was an effective action. It was a total effective action. They were 100% right. She was falsely claiming she... she Notice how she... She doesn't actually outright say there, I've called it a genocide because she actually knows that they're right when she had it. And, you know, actions like that, as AOC advocated, remember, she once famously said we should make people uncomfortable. That's the point of protest. That's what happened to her. And we saw the results. She actually did call it a genocide and, you know, better late than never. But that was a tribute, I think, to those activists confronting her about it. That was it was very well done. And uh, someone pointed out Joe Rogan has kind of spoken out as well. He's been pretty pathetic on this genocide and he's finally kind of declaring that he's had enough these these people all talk to each other too they're kind of like someone some of them are are pushing others to speak out and they're realizing that it's okay and you're not going to be destroyed and what do they what there's no future in corporate media or controlled opposition like the daily wire anyway um so yeah yeah there's there's a really only future in finding your freedom to say what you want uh, and, and speak the truth and that that's what's rewarded now uh, thankfully um, and so hope, hopefully more people will follow suit although of course it shouldn't have taken this long it should not have taken six months tens of thousands of murdered people including you know I don't know half of them children if not more uh, to call this for what it is but it's better late than never I'm gonna make a prediction. I rarely do. If this aid, like um, Gaza death port gets built by the U.S. military and they actually send contractors or U.S. troops into Gaza, we're going to start seeing Americans get killed. Hmm. And that is going to provoke a much deeper crisis than the World Central Kitchen massacre has. There's no way. I, I, I can't see it not happening. Yeah, there, Biden got uh, warned about that actually recently. Uh, this was in the Washington Post. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, that actually, he, he's, he's been given a warning uh, that uh, the pier could endanger U.S. forces. Uh, yeah, here it is. Um, it was in the Washington Post a few days ago. Biden's plan for Gaza pier endangers U.S. troops. Experts warn. Skeptics fear that humanitarian operation will be an enticing target for Hamas or other militants. Which for all we know, you know, uh, for all we know, like maybe somebody, you know, but maybe there's somebody who wants that to happen. You know, certainly maybe some Israelis do because um, because they want to draw the U.S. in. I mean, you can never <laughs> underestimate the cynicism behind these decisions and even calling it a humanitarian operation. Uh, that's not a fair term because, as you pointed out, this actually this peer idea originates with Israel, with Netanyahu. Um wanting uh, a way to, first of all, as we're seeing, deny aid to Gaza by land and also uh, build a, a means through which you can expel people. Um, so you can't even call this a humanitarian operation. Uh, do, do you know who uh, Joshua Molina is, the actor? No. He, uh, well, he's this like kind of like bit actor, kind of a wash up, uh, but he was attacking Anya the other day. Anya Parampil, our colleague at the Gray Zone. And uh, he was on the West Wing. And so Anya found this West Wing episode he was in. He actually plays uh, a Zionist, like an ultra Zionist. And he's he's become like a huge cheerleader for the genocide <laughs> uh, yeah. on Twitter. And, um, you know, so she found a Gaza episode on West Wing that I didn't know about. Basically the premise, and I didn't watch it all, so I don't know how it turns out, but the premise of the episode is that American military personnel in Gaza, this is under you know Arafat's control at that time, get killed. And the Democratic administration has to decide what to do. Should they strike the chairman, the chairman's office and attack Palestine in retaliation? And there's a young woman, there's like a younger woman who's in the NSC and 
she understands that Palestinians are under occupation and she wants to go and get on the ground and investigate this further. I don't know where it goes, but I think she suspects that it's actually an Israeli false flag. And then Israel jumps the gun and kills a Hamas commander without notifying the U.S. Uh, and you know the, the president, the the Secretary of State dresses down the Israeli ambassador. That was a simulation or uh, of Israel's assassination of Salah Shahada, the commander of Al Qassam brigades, who was killed along with everyone in his apartment building. The Bush administration actually condemned that, but it really felt like uh, a lot of events we're witnessing now. Uh, or a foreshadowing of what's to come when U.S. military personnel get into the fray there. Uh, and it's a perfect opportunity, yeah, for Israel to maybe uh, get one of those um, Salafi factions that it has re had relations with in Gaza that it has used, Shin Bet has used to undermine Hamas, uh, to carry out a bombing with an IED, kill some Americans and blame Hamas and say, hey, Blame Iran. Say they got this from 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 the IRGC and drag the U.S. in deeper. It's such a dangerous and crazy scenario that uh, I cannot believe the stupidity of the Biden administration here. Um, well, who knew that the West Wing could produce something uh, prescient? <laughs> you know. Uh, well, it's, it's a very anti-Palestinian undertone there, but I don't know where it wound up, but yeah, yeah, I, I never watched the West Wing. Did you? I've seen one episode uh, and it, it was hard to sit there. It was really difficult. It was very, very tough. Um, Anya also made me watch Scandal, which is like the Obama era version and with Kerry Washington, and it's significantly worse. It's just wow. Like, yeah. Can you imagine like the West Wing during Russiagate? <laughs> yeah, yeah, tough. The one thing I remember about the West Wing episode I watched was that like the pr president Bartlett, right? I think that was his name, played by Martin Sheen. He has like a like in this episode he's hospitalized, and um, the one aide who won't leave his side because he's, he's such a loyal aide is his black aide, right? So it's like like the black aide is like loyal to the white master basically and won't leave his side. You know, like that to me was the message. It was like this liberal fantasy of the, um, you know trusty uh black uh servant essentially uh yeah. serving the white president and it was just like so a, horrible like driving miss daisy or, exactly uh, yeah exactly or yeah. the or the white house uh press secretary right now yeah um well should we do havana syndrome Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about this. Yeah, I guess for some comic relief. Although I, I really, uh, I do want to make sure we talk a little bit about uh, Ukraine because. All right, let's do that because I got like five minutes here. Okay, so. okay, okay. We'll have to do Havana Center some other time, uh, for comic relief. But um, uh, yeah. Listen, oh, so you know, I got a sorry. I got an electromagnetic pulse attack from. Uh, oh. <laughs> I blame the Mossad. Yeah, you know, yeah, like there's someone uh, launching energy weapon outside outside Gray Zone Studios. Oh, maybe uh, it's crick, it's mating crickets outside here. <laughs> well, uh, thankfully, to combat Russia and their powerful energy weapons that are causing um, headaches for <laughs> American spooks worldwide, including uh, highly people. alcoholic spooks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, with who suffer from hangovers. Um, uh, We'll be countering Russia, it looks like, with another $61 billion in military assistance to the Ukraine proxy war. Because after months of stalling, uh, it, House Speaker Mike Johnson has indicated he will move a bill through Congress. He'll have a vote, and it's expected to overwhelmingly pass because basically all Democrats are expected to fall in line and vote for the Ukraine proxy war as they have so far, including the squad to be joined by many Republicans, and that would be enough to to push it through. And, and Mike Johnson being the only person standing in the way. And uh, Congressman Mike Lawler, who's a Republican, who supports the Ukraine proxy war funding, he was on CNN. He basically said that Mike Johnson is finally going to have a vote very soon. Has he given you any commitment that this vote will happen when the House returns from recess? Uh, I believe there will be a vote when we get back uh, from the Easter recess. Uh, certainly, uh, this is critically important uh, for our allies. Uh, we are the leader of the free world, and we cannot uh, shirk on our responsibility 
to to uphold uh, and defend democracies across the globe. It's why I uh, introduced, along with Brian Fitzpatrick and Jared Golden, uh, the Defending Borders, Defending Democracies Act, which would provide lethal aid to Ukraine, to Israel, uh, to Taiwan, uh, as well as uh, enact uh, serious border provisions, including Remain in Mexico and Title 42. Uh, and we are pushing for a vote. I have signed a discharge petition uh, to allow for that vote, uh, but I am hopeful that the speaker will put the bill on the floor uh, or an amended version of the bill on the floor uh, so that we can once and for all uh, ensure that our allies have the aid and support that they need. And just watch how pressed Dana Bash is to make sure this money is going to happen. So that's all she cares about. <laughs> have you, I'm assuming you've spoken to him directly. Has he made a commitment? I, I have spoken to him directly. I'm not going to uh, delve into Anyway, and he went on, and so Mike Johnson went on later that day to say that, yes, there will be a vote soon. And his whole thing is he's going to, uh, he wants Biden to approve some uh, gas projects in Louisiana that Biden has shut down, which I'm sure he'll get. And also he wants to, you know, some of the money, he wants it to be a loan rather than a grant to Ukraine. Uh, and also they want to just cut, they're fine with the military component of this bill, but they want to cut some of the humanitarian aid for Ukraine. So that's a Republican line, military aid, just less humanitarian aid. And so that's what it looks like is going to happen. And Biden will get a $61 billion, even though this is really like a centerpiece of his reelection campaign is this proxy war. The Republicans, uh, they're so committed to hegemony that they're going to give it to him um, and basically help fund his reelection campaign. And what kind of difference that'll make on the battlefield, I, I don't really think it matters at this point because Ukraine is running out of people to sacrifice. They've just lowered, uh, Zelensky just signed that measure to lower the age of conscription from 27 to 25. After prodding from Lindsey Graham, who went to Kiev and said that uh, you guys need to lower the conscription age, so presumably uh, they could fulfill their role of fighting to the last person, as he bragged about uh, early on in, in the proxy war. So that's what's happening now, and it, it's just another uh, um, example of how neocons in Washington, they always fail, but they always get what they want, and that's what it looks like will happen here. And what, do you, what are some of the big ticket items in the $61 billion of military aid or, or however much they're going to deliver? And, and what, what, what difference would they actually make on the battlefield? Well, yeah, oh, that's the thing. Amazingly, half of the money, according to the Washington Post, half of the money is for future assistance. So not even anything that will go to Ukraine now. So the point of this measure is to lock this proxy war in for years to come. Uh, and they want to do that because they're worried about Donald Trump getting into office and him scaling it back. Um, so they want to make sure that Trump's hands are tied. And again, I'm not even sure Trump would do anything different than Biden. Um, certainly Biden, when Trump was in office, he did a lot to uh, ensure that this war would happen. He gave weapons to Ukraine that Obama wouldn't give. But regardless, just in, just in case he changed his mind and he actually would try to end the war, this this measure seeks to lock it in. So it's not even so much about Ukraine's short-term needs, although this will probably give them more air defense missiles and attackums, which they really want to be able to strike Crimea. But the main goal here, I think, is just to lock this war in for years to come, no matter what happens on the battlefield this year. And I mean, I, I really haven't seen any of these NATO weapons make any difference at any point. So this is really about what Victoria Newland said on her way out before becoming a I guess a professor at Columbia SEPA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> learn, learn, learn uh, you know, the art of the coup and, yeah. um, you know, handing cookies out to Nazis. Uh, but she said, you know, this is about job creation. This money is coming back to the U S this military aid in the form of contracts and money and new houses for the contractors in the beltway. It's basically what she's saying. So it's future aid. It's military Keynesianism. It's one of the few productive, industries in the u.s and they're keeping the big five alive the big blue chip arms makers i think that's what this is about um and you know you, you also have this the scenario after the crocus hall attack in which russia is increasingly pointing the finger at some ukrainian involvement i mean there are arrests of suspects in dagestan they're starting to unpack the fsb is starting to unravel the network 
I don't know what Ukrainian elements, uh, Budinov, Kirill Budinov, the um, Ukrainian intel, uh, intelligence chief, uh, or, or was he moved up to chief of staff? Complete trainee of the CIA, complete product of the CIA. He has fervently denied it. And it's a very tense moment for Ukraine because if somehow their involvement is proven, I think that would impact the debate around this aid. So they got to ram it through quickly before anything else can be found. Although I, I don't see any evidence they were directly involved. Uh, they've committed other terror attacks. Vladlin Tatarsky, Daria Dugina, yeah. the Kerch Bridge, bombing the Christmas festival in, in Belgorod, in Belgorod um, you know, and so on. And that's what the attackums are going to be used for, more terror. Yeah. But I don't see any involvement here. But it's still a very tense moment for Kiev. And, and uh, yeah. yeah, and and just to make sure that everyone gets on board, this is this was recently in the New York Times. Russia amps up online campaign against Ukraine before U.S. <laughs> elections, and it's written by the reliable stenographers Julian Barnes and David David Easter. Sanger. Um, and basically, <laughs> the whole point of the article is that if you are skeptical of giving more money for this proxy war, then you're a dupe of Russia. That's so there. Are, you know, people, pr proxy warriors are, are ramping up or amping up their online campaigns to make sure everybody falls into line. And it looks like Mike Johnson will do just that because neocons always win, even though they're the world's biggest losers. <sighs> they're the world's biggest winners in a way. I mean, they just keep moving up the ranks yep. of our of our meritocracy. And they've returned home to the Democratic Party. I cannot believe anyone in and with any conscience could both could vote for biden after watching this live stream um people are asking i don't see any involvement of ukraine well i don't i mean what what am i supposed to say uh yeah uh, ukraine has like provided some uh sanctuary for some former isis members yeah there there might be a connection but i don't have any any evidence uh, and I'm not like, I'm not, you know, involved in any investigation here. Yeah, our, uh, uh, our FSB handler hasn't provided us with any evidence yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've taken a similar position and I, I understand why people, I uh, think the worst, because we're talking about the world's most cynical, diabolical people and, uh, Ukrainians, as you pointed out, have committed terror attacks, uh, both inside Ukraine, um, against, uh, like Russophile Ukrainians and inside Russia, but, um, I, I haven't seen the evidence yet to, to support it. And, uh, I, I'm not going to just assume the worst based on what's possible. And, uh, you know, again, look, there was a U.S. warning to Russia about this and Putin at the time sort of dismissed it. He called it an attempt to sow discord. And I understand why he did that because the U.S. has been trying to overthrow him forever. So why, you know, it's understandable why he might see this as yet another such attempt to just basically, um, uh, weak in confidence in him. Uh, and also there's another, actually another thing in the New York times uh, recently said that the U S did warn Russia, but did not share everything it knew because it didn't want to compromise sources and methods. Right. And so, you know, understandably then the Kremlin was, was skeptical of the U S but look, there was that warning. Um, and it's plausible to me that ISIS, uh, which Russia, uh, dealt a massive blow to inside Syria would want to strike Russia, uh, that makes sense to me. But you know, if Russia has evidence of Ukrainian government involvement or the involvement of Ukrainian ultra nationalists, which it's also said, then they can show it. But I personally haven't seen it yet. I'll make two points before we go. I wasn't really ready to talk about this, but um, you know, just feel like I owe it to the audience to give uh, to offer a sharper perspective. Um, there, there's a point. Uh, actually, Al Alex Mercurius. Uh, Al Al um, Alex Christ Christophero brought it up on the Duran, um, something that I was also looking at, which is that within the same 48 hours of this Crocus Hall attack, there was a concert of Shaman, who is the most popular Russian performer, uh, rock performer. It's basically a state-backed performer. He has this song, I'm Russian, which is sort of like a defiant song against the West. Um, it's like, I'm proud of who I am. You want to like cancel us and sanction us, but we're, you know, and, and the nationalist patriotic Russian youth have taken to it. This concert was apparently blanketed with armed security. 
And it would have been actually a political target, not a random target like Crocus Hall, but a political target given the nationalist significance of shaman, especially after Putin's re-election with uh, something like 88% participation. Yeah, there wasn't like a real viable uh, um, opposition, but his approval rating is 85% now. So matches up. So, you know, when you consider the possibility that that could have been the first target and that the attacker is passed on it because of the um, thick security and moved on to a concert hall where there was no armed security, that raises the question about more political motives directly related to Putin. Point number two, Rand Corp's weakening Russia paper which I'm sure many of our audience is familiar with, I think was published, Aaron, in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically a public blueprint for how to unravel and balkanize Putin's Russia and return it to Russia in the 90s. There is uh, guidance there or recommendation to drag Russia into conflict in the Caucasus in its south with its own Muslim population and with neighboring Muslim populations in places like Tajikistan, where the attackers come from, sort of a repeat of the Chechnyan wars, which weakened Russia so much in which Putin put an end to. The CIA was definitely involved in the second uh, theater of the Chechnyan war. So mm -hmm. it would make sense then from the point of view of, you know, I don't know, British intelligence, the people who produced the blueprint for attacking the Kerch Bridge, or even US intelligence, anyone who wants to balkanize and weaken Russia uh, to get Russia to react, overreact to an attack like this and begin creating um, more friction towards its south and getting diverted from the existential war in Ukraine uh, to divert Russia, for Russian resources from Ukraine, and also to create tension and conflict within its own society where you have like, what, like a million uh, Muslim guest workers in the Moscow region. Uh, or in the country um, to get, you know, far right groups targeting them. And so Putin has had to strike a very um, deliberate tone, a multicultural tone, emphasizing the multicultural nature of Russia and opposing hate crimes and uh, Islamophobic discrimination while, you know, his FSB, they're cutting the ears off these guys. <laughs> like, uh, it, 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 and so the, 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 there is a, it's, it is a precarious situation inside Russia that has been that, um, that this attack has fomented. And that does match up with a lot of the recommendations in the Rand Corp report. So all I can say is I understand why people are skeptical of the official line. I understand why Russia is pointing the finger where it is, but I just don't, I don't have the concrete evidence I don't have the like cold cuts and deli meats to put on the kind of sandwich of skepticism that I laid out. So until then, I can't really make any proclamations. Well, fair enough. I, I think all those are really good points. And I also just echo that I, I totally understand why people don't buy the official line from the US. It's totally fair. Uh, we're talking about people who routinely lie to the public all the time. So um, I, I encourage skeptical thinking and, you know, um, like with like, if there's more evidence, it will come out. So we'll see. Well, thanks everyone for joining as always. Um, another great audience. Um, thanks a lot to Eric Thomas, Eric T. Red for moderating the chat. And uh, definitely check out Savvy Sabs, which Eric produces. Uh, one of the best podcasts out there. And, um, and thank you, Aaron, as always. Um, great job. We will be back next week. Uh, like the stream, subscribe. I mean, get it. We're, we're, we're going to close in on 400,000 soon, uh, despite heavy suppression by YouTube, despite constant demonetization. Um, and, uh, yeah. Anything you want to add? No, I'm just imagining where we'd be if not for, uh, suppression i think it'd be a lot more than four hundred thousand, but whatever we'll take it uh and thanks everybody for watching we'll see you next time peace